first thing that happens when you know you want to do a script is you start to see it right away. And with the Book of Eli, immediately I knew I wanted to do the movie. This script grabbed us because the environment was so different and the story was so different. Visually, it started coming like, okay, this is the way, way it should look. We had conceptual artists working with us from the beginning. They not only did storyboards, but they did illustrations. We could have made a graphic novel on this movie. So Albert and I just bounced ideas off of them and rendering the world the way we thought it should look. We'd figure out, well, this would be a cool scene to illustrate, and then try and come up with the whole look and feel for the entire feature. I mean, right off the bat, they created a, like a booklet, a little pamphlet that they made. And this little book really sold a lot of people that this was something special. We had to see the world. Let's put together a few books that the whole cast and crew can look at and just get the vibe of the movie. It's been a good guide for everybody. You don't have to always describe it in such detail. You go, here, here's the picture of the scene I want. Well, they have such a great vision to begin with. You know, they've been working on this movie for two years. Boom, boom, boom. And I'm feeling like you need some kind of cover at this point. In this movie, we worked a little differently than normal. I've never, I've done, been doing this for 30 years and I've been producing probably for 20 some years. I've never worked with uh, two directors who storyboarded the entire, almost the entire movie and they shot listed the entire movie. Prior to the commencement of principal photography, every scene had a complete shot list of how the brothers envisioned shooting the movie. I think after we saw the shots, as compared to what we had prepped, you know, it was surprisingly very similar. I would describe the Book of Eli as ripe with decay. I think that everything is broken. The world, the roads, the atmosphere. Everything is falling down or crumbling. The look of the world in this movie was, you know, two parts. One is the design that's unset, weathered, destroyed black in and then the other is the film and we made the decision to desaturate the picture by 50 to 70 percent i wanted to take it back to a like a 70s uh, movie like an old print from a 70s movie which is it's really desaturated and it's a little grainy and a little grimy you know and the highlights are really blown out and the blacks are black or uh you know there's just nothing stands out as far as a major color palette it's more monochromatic it brings it to life more, you know. Certain colors pop, certain colors don't pop. You know, hopefully from the, the design on set and how you treat the film, you come up with an interesting look that's not been seen before. The vision of the movie plays into the themes of what's going on and I think gives the movie a unique look in a unique world that you haven't seen before. We're on stage four in Albuquerque Studios shooting the underpass scene where uh, Eli fights about six guys in silhouette. Denzel was gonna do all these fight scenes on his own. There was gonna be no stunt double. But this is beyond doing your own stunt. This is more doing your own fights. Hitting every mark and making sure it looks real. And that's a whole other form of, of acting there. Um, and he, he took it on with, you know, with gusto. Actually, I take a step back. Uh, in the underpass fight, again, on green screen, uh, that fight was done from beginning to end with Denzel and the stunt people. What we did is add a CG sword, <laughs> CG body parts, and then of course lots of blood and destruction and chainsaws and skies and put it into a motion control move and a moving camera move on the street in the underpass. All right, we're gonna do it the hard way. He just cut my hand So off. there are probably close to 25 different elements that go into putting a shot like this together. And when you look at it in the end, it's still, and it is meant to be, a classic, simply framed Sergio Leone type of style. <laughs> but with this visceral, gutsy street fight, you know, in the, in the middle of it. I do all my own fights. It's me. No, no, stop men jumping in there. Jeff Amato, who is our fight coordinator, has done a lot of great sequences in the movies. He did the work on uh, Fight Club and The Last Samurai and the Born Identity films. 
preparation for the for the film was really a lot of fun just to to uh, go to the dojo and, and, and train with Jeff Amada and Danny Inosanto for about four or five months before we started shooting. I am very impressed with Denzel Washington. He's a really a good student. I'm not just saying that because he uh, worked out here for six months or so. He really, uh, he could ask, he do the technique. Basically, I put him into a crash course into all different aspects of fighting. This feels like a true ride. Uh, watching other people trying to learn the same techniques, they sometimes take three months, maybe two months to learn the same things that he was learning in just one session. He's that sharp. This is the first time since 1972, Enter the Dragon, when Bruce Lee, a major motion picture star, has done an action sequence himself in one take, one shot. History is being made right over there. All right, start it from the top, just right there. So it was a lot of fun, and I, I had read the scripts. So I knew I was going to win the fights. <laughs> so. We're down here in uh, downtown Carrizozo. We needed a valley town, and what we tried to do is to find an existing town where we could use a sort of a skeleton and kind of transform that into what you see here today. We were looking for a location that was a town that might need a little financial assistance and might also have some missing buildings in it so that we could build in ruined structures. We're taking existing buildings in Carrizozo and converting them into uh, post apocalyptic town. So what I'm in the process of doing is taking the photographs and converting them into construction documents. We build it up, redesign it, and then we blow it up, and then we age it. It's a pretty rigorous process. And then we also had wonderful research of buildings from war-torn towns that were just crumbling brick walls. You see it's so almost like buildings from, all, all, you know, looking almost like from the Second World War, and it looks like London or Berlin or somewhere. There are a lot of resources here, photos from around the world that show disasters of, of all types, whether from earthquakes or airplane crashes, places that have been bombarded by cannons, for instance, Del Moro in Puerto Rico. Action! Get out of the room. This was never intended to be a Mad Max kind of cool world where everything's designed to look as badass as possible. We wanted a world that looked real. There's a little town, just the beginning. I'm about to expand. It's a bombed out town, there's a civilization here. It's one of the few pockets of civilization in the movie. You've never seen the other town. We wanted to create a town that wasn't too Western, that had a little bit of urban feel to it. The icons of a former civilization that we've placed throughout had to be ironic and they had to be tasteful and they had to be placed just where needed. We didn't want to overdo it. Everything you see, all the facades, is all of ours. We've hardly used anything from the major town. Every single surface has about four or five colors on it. The undercoats, the peeling coats, the aging coats. All of our extras we hired locally. Today we have 100 extras. This is a, a town that has a 1,000 people population. We're probably the biggest thing that's happened here since the town was built in 1920. And the town only consisted of a half a block of construction. It was extended on both sides anytime we looked down either side of the street. Literally, you walk into a post-apocalyptic universe. Evan Jones. I play Martz and I'm a biker <gasps> and uh, I'm hired by Carnegie and we're supposed to go out and capture the books and bring them back to Carnegie because he wants this one in particular book. We're bikers so we got these crazy Harley Davidsons with pieces of metal hooked up on them, weapons, machetes and stuff like that. The original idea was that they, they scavenged everything. If you look really closely they're really patched together from street signs, freeway signs, uh, you know, old seats from tractors, um, things like that. 
we were in charge of building the motorbikes. I'll show you how this one sounds. This was our favourite sounding bike. So what we did is we stripped the motorbikes right down and started the game with concept drawings and some ideas of our own. We had some bear traps that we just threw on because I like the look of them. We just threw the bear traps on. It took us about, um, I would say, uh, six weeks, six weeks to do the four bikes. They obviously found these bikes in a condition that needed some work to it and they built what was needed to make them run. They, they used any materials they could get hold of. You can see we used bigger wheels, like they got found these wheels and used that. In this one we built the uh, modified tanks. And you can see that the art department did a lovely job making these look like uh, road signs. As you can see, you've got uh, Route 80 there. Then we have another piece of a road sign here, which gives it even more character. He's used a lovely uh, saddle, mm -hmm. materials that they found mm -hmm. and used. It wasn't about the motorcycles, but the detail went into those, because the story is not, not about scavenging or not about that, but you want to put those in there so that the audience, they, they feel it. Jeff Amato, who is our, you know, fight coordinator, has done a lot of, you know, great sequences and movies. And uh, he was very good about one thing, which is he doesn't go A, B, C, he's gonna fight this guy, then fight this guy. He stands in the middle of a room and says, okay, I want you guys all to attack me at once. And then he works from what the, what the reality of five guys coming at you at the same time would be. Fighting multiple opponents is always challenging because you're generally not focused on one person. And when you have multiple opponents, they're not necessarily coming one at a time. A lot of times they're all coming at the same time. And so what I do is I have um, my guys come at me with whatever they feel they would, they would want to attack with. And then I would try and figure a way to combat them or, or defend against that, that situation. So it's organic and raw and making it try and feel like it's natural. Because if you visually, if you see something, coming at you, it has to process through your, through your vision, through your brain, and then react. But if you feel something, your reaction can be much faster. So instead of having a two, two motion action where you're blocking and punching, it'll be sort of like a simultaneous motion where you feel something and you come in and take care of the opponent as quickly as possible. And there's a kind of like a, a beauty in the way he choreographs all that stuff because he uses this guy towards that guy, he uses this guy's weapon to hit this guy. It's one jumbled mess at first and then all of a sudden it just turns into this not that gets undone. With Albert and Alan, we got together and we talked about the concept. And um, there are certain things that we're, they were really looking for. As far as Denzel's abilities to be able to do, do everything himself, to be able to uh, fight multiple opponents all, all in one shot. So there are probably close to 25 different elements that go into putting a shot like this together. We knew, we wanted Eli in the center of the action. We wanted, Albert wanted a, a spotlight right on Eli. It was meant to be a stylistic shot. And then we wanted the camera to move around Eli. And um, we had to build a 30 foot diameter motion control dolly track, which is a big job. It's not like any other dolly track. It has gears all the way around to drive it. And um, then, of course, as we shot, we had to paint out the track on the opposite side because you see it everywhere you go. So after you shot three or four different takes of Denzel fighting and then 10 or 12 different takes of people, heads falling and people falling over and arms getting chopped off and chairs flying in, 
Um, then you had to go back and essentially paint yourself out of the room. So ultimately you look at it and you say, it's a pretty simple shot. And it looks very simple, but it was a it was a bear to get something that perfect and looking on the center. Eli's approach to to violence is to try not to have it happen at all. He is a, a very peaceful, humble man, and a, a man of few words. Uh, he, he's uh, bordering on pacifist, you know, um, but knows the world he's dealing in. And that what you want. There's a lot of desperation and loneliness, so, uh, you know, people will kill you just for your shirt, you know, in this, this kind of world. Uh, I want to do a movie about faith, and Eli, he has a very positive representation of a religious faith. It's just something that gives him the strength day after day. To, to keep walking, to keep moving on his quest. I always believed that I'd find a place where this book belonged, where it was needed. I haven't found it yet. Eli's mission or belief or faith is based on protecting something, trying to get this book somewhere and nothing will stand in his way. And the only time he, the violence uh, comes out of him is when he's actually cornered. Camera marker. Action! In his desire to protect this book and to do what he's been charged to do, he gets to a place where his anger is taken over. Like he's bringing it, so you better be ready. George and Martha's. George and Martha's is uh, a little house in the middle of the desert. Eli and Solara are walking across the desert. They come to a house inhabited, which is pretty odd in this environment. And they meet George and Martha. The world is gone. No, no water. No food. No food. It's, no, it's, weird. it's a disaster. Um, we think everybody's a threat, because they are. It's about survival. Very sorry, I, I didn't see it. God. God. <laughs> Eli has survived all through the film up till now with Solara, and he meets these old survivalists. I'm Martha. Would you care for some tea? I think George and Martha represent some normalcy out in the middle of nowhere, older couple that, that want to have tea eventually. How about some music? It's so soothing. George. And it spoke to what the world had become. Here's these two holdouts. They're in their 70s or, you know, uh, older than anybody in the movie. And they're, uh, they're out there in the middle of nowhere, kind of uh, almost Norman Rockwell-esque, you know. And um, it just kind of turns. Are these graves? Sure. Be uncivilized, not to bury them. Besides, it's good for the soil. Come on back inside. I think I might be able to rustle you up some sandwiches. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And we, then this whole posse arrives. Horrible. Gary Oldman and his, <laughs> and his crew. He's <laughs> playing this horrible man who causes our death, shoots us. Roll, please. Roll in. Roll in, roll in. Sounds good. Here we go. Set. Fire in the hole. Ready and action. We have about a a two-minute shot that takes about three, four days to shoot it. it. Takes off in the house, through the house. As the camera comes through the window, we track along here. As we're tracking, all this wall will show us all the bullet hits that are coming through from the gang outside firing. Out again, around a car, with the weapons, and uh, no cuts. 
Bucks, a continuous two-minute firefight. We're going to do as much as we can in front of camera. That's bullet hits and, and pieces of wood flying and cameras coming in and out. We have an RPG rocket that's going to come through the window. And what we're doing there is putting a, what we call an air mortar and firing it towards camera. And we've uh, rigged all this house with all kinds of different bullet hits and squibs. We tear the house apart gradually until the very end when the shredder comes out, which is a Gatling gun, which pretty much just decimates the entire front of the house. It's going to be pretty intense. But we were cautious about trying not to have this guy look or feel like any other character that you've seen in cinema before. The character had to be carrying things that he, just the necessary items he needed. Uh, they'd be multi-use, not only for fighting, but for hunting and, and, uh, and cleaning and cooking and different things like that. Well, originally the script that was handed to us, he had a samurai sword. And as we got closer to production, you know, Denzel had a few ideas. I think there's a lot of Asian influence in the film and, you know, the, the whole loner aspect. Of, originally written, I think he had a, a samurai sword. I'm like, no, we can't do that. I think he was pretty right on about, you know, we've seen it in a lot of yeah. movies. Let's change this up. And uh, my brother printed up all these cutlery, knives, and swords. Denzel at one point said, what about a machete? Because, you know, down there in Jamaica, those, those kids come up as like an extension of their arm. They do everything with the machete. So that's a cool idea. So then, I found some machetes and I found some kind of samurai uh, big edge swords and uh, I tried to make a hybrid samurai kind of machete. Then we saw this, this cutlery knife, like this butcher knife that had holes in the back side of it. Samurai machete and this kind of African machete and combined them into one, uh, a hybrid. This is the prototype plastic sword that we're making. If he has a backpack on, then he'll have it probably underneath here, so it won't be sticking out by his head, something like that, and he could pull it out. We make the sword out of aircraft aluminum. It's light, it's strong, and it doesn't bend too much. And then we'll probably make one out of polyurethane in case somebody gets hit by it, it won't hurt so much. You look at the weapon um, that he's using in this movie as far as the machete goes, and that was completely created for his character. There's, there's only one of a kind out there. And uh, it, you know, it looks different, and that was the whole intent behind it. And he, he relies more on that than he does the guns. Today we're doing uh, the convoy that Carnegie has set out to find Eli and Solara. Um, they do find them, and today Solara fights back. Go strong for that movie. Yeah, here we go. Here we go. Action. Well, on this particular show, we did uh, a lot of armor on these vehicles. Um, one, we had to build a very sturdy roll cage to protect our driver. Also, we used a high-pressure nitrogen ram. Uh, the reason we use that is because the actual car is not blown by any sort of pyro or explosion. It spins out of control because of the chap being strangled. So we used an air ram to flip the car over while he was driving it. It's a one-time deal, so we've got to get it right. This is actually a live feed from the It's a difficult thing when you work in VFX because a lot of you know, visual effects are not there. And sometimes it's very frustrating because you can't see. And finally it's coming to life very late in the stage. So then you, there is one thing to get excited about. Like, wow, look at the way that looks. And then it does its three flips. 
and we were just letting visual effects take a look at it because he's going to be matching this in post production. Let's bring up that still. Today we're doing the, the post explosion of the Suburban. It's just rolled over three times. We shot that yesterday, and our girl's gonna get out. Action! And she gets the bad guys out of there, gets a grenade, and Carnegie and his crew are trying to come back for her, and she throws a grenade. There, there are two shots in that sequence. One is a wide profile of her throwing in the truck, you know, uh, blowing up. The other one is uh, a close-up of her pulling the pin and we're on her and we dolly back as she throws the grenade at camera. And when we pan with the grenade and it passes camera and bounces on the ground, we follow it as the truck comes up and then blows up. Uh, that shot consists of a number of elements. Uh, Mila throwing the grenade, so she throws a sandbag, a small sandbag in her hand past camera, and we pull back and whip pan with it. Um, then we had to dig a hole in the street so that when we whipped our camera around and we came down, the lens was supposed to sit right on top of the asphalt, so we had to get the whole camera body under. So then we had to come around and then settle into this hole in the road as we pushed forward. No cars coming at us. We couldn't do that with Mila there. Cut. Then you do the whole thing again, this time with the cars driving towards you. Checking the clearance so we don't ruin the camera. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Um, and now that our lens is mounted right above the street, now we lock off the camera and then we let the cars literally drive over the camera. We had one opportunity to film the truck blowing up and uh, we, uh, of course, covered it with seven cameras in order to get it. Now we're going to rehearse just the timing of the bank truck and the ice cream truck. The bank truck's going to be towing the ice cream truck down the road. It's going to be on a release. They blow the release. As soon as they blow the release, the bank truck veers off, comes off into the dirt, and the ice cream truck will go over those plates out there on the road and, and, it, and we'll turn it up. So uh, we knew going into it, we were going to get the biggest pop we could and fly the truck in the air and then fix what didn't pan out perfectly. So then you take all those elements and you put it all together, hook it up with a CG matte painting for the whip pan and a 3D grenade and just simply goes together like that. San Francisco was a tough one. The look of the movie, all the way up to that point, had been desaturated and harsh. And it's not until San Francisco, the first time in the movie, we start seeing vegetation, green grass, skies are warmer, a little more hopeful, and the saturation, the colors coming back in the movie. It was meant to be literally a ray of light, a moment of hope and vitality. I mean, that's when you, you see green a little bit. That's it. Here's the thing that was visually very difficult. What's the difference between a destroyed world that's being overgrown with life or a living world that's been destroyed and both are at about the same level? One looks like a living world that's just been hurt and the other one looks like a destroyed world that's starting to feel some kind of resurrection. Visually, it's a difficult thing to do. An example of this is um, when Eli says, You smell that? What? In the air? 
So. And the Suburban is driving past the destruction and just starting to get into the areas of green. In this situation, we didn't want this to look like a clean world that had been bombed out. We wanted it to look like a bombed out world where grass and vegetation was growing over the soot and growing back into it. So we had to have our green and life fingering into the destruction as opposed to harsh cuts. It's meant to like be an exhale, a relief moment and a hopeful moment. Before we even started shooting principal photography, we went to San Francisco for three days and we shot from a helicopter all of our location positions on the shoreline at uh, Chrissy Fields, all the stuff from the boat in the water, everything on Alcatraz, and that gave us our blueprint. From that, we were able to start a lot of uh, pre-visualization, CG models, the Golden Gate Bridge, and so on. We weren't going to shoot San Francisco with our actors in front of green screen and set pieces for set extensions until the end of the schedule. So that's really hard to do something of that extent and then not shoot it. Is it true what they tell me? So we had to do it all the way at the end, so we had to be ready for that. It's a difficult thing when you work in VFX because a lot of you know, visual effects are not there. And sometimes it's very frustrating because you can't see. And finally it's coming to life very late in the stage. So then you, there is one thing to get excited about. Like, wow, look at the way that looks. There was a lot of prep, a lot of work, and even in the end we were working on those shots until the last second. should be the ground, for our sake. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for us. Okay. For out of the ground we were taken for the dust we are, and to the dust we shall return. Between this movie and the last one, it's been about seven or eight years. And in, in that time period, we've been always trying to find something that, you know, grabbed us. The script was just amazing. It, it had all the right ingredients. Everything is broken. The system, the world, the roads, the atmosphere, it's just, it's, it is ripe with decay. <laughs> the environment was so different and the story was so different. Visually, it seemed exciting and, uh, also, uh, you, you know, you, you have these movies out there that are post-apocalyptic, but this one may be put in that category, but it felt so out of that, that realm. We knew we wanted the skies to be a character, you know, and to, uh, to be saying something and to be moving a certain direction, the same direction that Eli is moving. It's a very unusual look, as you know, you know, where uh, you've seen a lot of post-apocalyptic movies, and they all happen in big cities. This is rural America. All the people in this town, all the people in this world, through most of the movie, have never seen a blade of grass. They've never seen vegetation. It's dry, it's dank, it's dark. Uh, very specific look to this movie, something I've never seen before. You know, it's the first movie we've done with this many visual effects, and, and sometimes it's very frustrating because you can't see. So we brought on these artists, you know, Tommy Lee Edwards, Chris Weston, Rodolfo DiMaggio, and these guys are all from the comic book world. And nowadays, a lot of movies are being made from graphic novels and comic books, so we kind of reversed it in a way and said, well, let's get our look together with these guys and, you know, had one of them do the storyboards, had two of them do the visual kind of layout of the movie with the color uh, template and everything like that. And let's put together, put together a few books that uh, the whole cast and crew can look at and just get the vibe of the movie. And, uh, you know, it's worked from pre-production through post-production. I work in lots of different mediums, so sometimes I could be drawn with charcoal or working on the computer or working with paint, you know, it doesn't matter. So uh, it depends on what the job calls for. So I go through the script and see in my mind a certain shot and 
send Albert some ideas, some sketches. Maybe we could shoot it this way, we could shoot it that way. You know, do we see him from, you know, the front or from behind? And then we just talk about all that stuff and, you know, we wean it down into the finished piece. I collaborate with the uh, art department a lot, especially with the guys who actually sat down and designed the set, and they'll give me all kinds of plans, uh, which I'll refer to when doing my storyboards. Here's a plan of George and Martha's house, and so then when I come to draw the, the scene that takes place there, the two match up. Both of us. This is a dream job for me because uh, I'm kind of known previously in the comic strip industry for doing sort of gritty, realistic artwork and and with, with, with a slight air of decadence to it and you know decaying matter. And uh, I, I think I, that's probably what Albert recognised you know in my work. You know, it's probably why he wanted me to be on Book of Eli because. Everything in the, the world of the Book of Eli is falling down or crumbling or it, it, it's not looking too good. In creating the style books and some of the shot sequences have been really, really informative of how we were going in and adapting any of the sequences for the building or for any of the breakdowns of the sets. I think after we saw on the set the shots, you know, as compared to what we had prepped, you know, it was very similar. I'm actually really blown away at how close it looks to, to what, you know, Albert and I had worked up so long ago, you know, so it's, it's really cool. <laughs> I love it. There was a certain look that Albert was going for that I don't think has been done to the extent that we've done in this film. Um, it just makes it makes the world, it brings it to life more. I think that their take on it was was brilliant because it 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 takes something that we've heard of and we've seen before in a society like this and it brings it to a place that we've never seen before. Eli is a hero in the traditional movie sense, you know, because he does save uh, one or two people, um, not on purpose or not because he wanted to, but because he had to, you know. <laughs> I think Eli uh, is an archetype character that we've seen. There's a little bit of a, the wandering monk, you know. Um, we've seen little bits and pieces of, of it in other movies, but we haven't seen it like this. I just thought it was an interesting character that uh, was on a mission and was being tested. Yeah, it was very important to me from the beginning that Eli wasn't uh, like an ex-soldier or a combat vet or somebody that would already have these skills. I really wanted him to be an everyman. I think she's fascinated by Eli when she first meets him. Um, there's obviously something about him that, that she's drawn to. She's never really seen a man like him. And I think she just starts learning from him. And I think that inspires her to you know, go and, and do something for herself. And his desire to protect this book and to do what he's been charged to do, and he's been doing it for so long and shedding a lot of blood to do it. I don't want any trouble. I think he gets to a place where his anger, his violence has taken over. Stop! Eli's a very peaceful, humble man, and a, a man of few words. And the only time he, the violence uh, comes out of him is when he's actually cornered. Open the pack and tip it out on the road nice and slow. Can't do that. You know, when somebody's, uh, or a several group of people have put him in a position where he, he has to he has to fight to, to survive. All right, we're gonna do it the hard way. He obviously learned along the way how to fight, how to use different tools, whether it be gun, bow and arrow, machete. He, if you pay close attention, you'll see he doesn't really want to use his gun most of the time because the bullets are very scarce. It's, it's about efficiency for him, you know, it's about how to get from here to there in the simplest way. Part of the influence, uh, the inspiration for the character was looking at the old biblical stories of 
people who get chosen by God, characters like Job, who get plucked from obscurity and, and given these incredible hardships. He's just a man. To test their faith. He has a, a, a presence and a, a charisma and a, and a quiet to him. It's steady and it's resolute and it's composed. I've never seen anyone quite like him. But then I've never met anyone quite like Denzel. From early on, Denzel was a part of the, the project. For us, that was the icing on the cake. I mean, to see Denzel play a role like this that you've never seen Denzel Washington play before is just fantastic. He, he shed about uh, 50 pounds plus, um, and that's not to mention the physical training he was doing, uh, uh, and then the fight training he was doing with Jeff Amata. Man, he was doing stuff that I couldn't do. I know I couldn't do. The preparation for the for the film was really a lot of fun. Just to to uh, go to the dojo and, and and train with those guys. I guess we trained for about I don't know four or five months before we started shooting. And I, I had read the scripts. So I knew I was going to win the fights. <laughs> so working with Denzel has been a great experience. Um, He's a very smart actor, very intelligent, very physical, uh, works hard, wants to be, he's a perfectionist. I mean, I mean, that's probably why he is where he is today, because he's such a perfectionist, never completely satisfied. Probably has a photographic memory for all I know, because he remembers every detail. I would say I've never seen anybody prep so hard, you know, work nonstop to get the script right. You know, we'd be over his house for hours, you know, eight, nine, ten hours, and he just wants to talk about the characters, wants to talk about characters that have nothing to do with him, wants to go back over the other versions of the script, what, what can we mine out of there. Denzel, ironically, started working on Carnegie first, and he flushed that character out. He used to always say, um, the good guy is only as good as the bad guy. <laughs> and it, was, it was Denzel's idea for Gary Oldman as well. I decided to come on as a producer because I wanted to help them, you know, and in, in, in surrounding them with talent, you know, not just in front of the camera, but, not, but behind the camera. Well, Denzel, for us, uh, not only professionally, but as, as moviegoers, is one of our, our best actors. I think there are very few actors who could pull this role off. He felt he's very method, you know, he totally became this character. And um, it, was, it was quite astonishing, you know, when we were working on the script, you know, he would get up and move around and become Eli in the room. And we, we got like a little glimpse of how he was going to bring this character to life. There's one scene where Salar and Eli are sitting by a fire and he kind of explains to her more or less faith. And in that conversation, she, she, she starts understanding how to have faith. It's hard to explain, but it was like it, like it was coming from inside of me. Initially, he thought his job was to protect, to protect this book, not to let anybody touch it, not to let anybody get near it until it gets to where it, it, it belongs. And um, he comes to find out a part of his task is to teach and to share. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. That's beautiful. You know, it's like the more you, the older you get, the more you know you don't know anything. <laughs> he, he, he's at a place uh, suddenly in the, in the life of our movie where he's learning a lot. They both have a, a goal, a belief, an obsession. He's on one journey, Denzel's on another, and that's where the collision takes place and you know that's where the battle begins. We are representatives of uh, different you know principalities and good and evil if you, if you will. One of the main uh, agendas Gary and I both had about the role of Carnegie which is the bad guy again was not to make him a cliche bad guy because he's not a bad guy. He's he's a guy who does bad things. Ah! Your mother would like you to tell I don't know. Show me! It, they talk about it's not black and white, it's gray with him. So there are scenes in the movie where you do see a, a, a humanity come out of Carnegie. And I think that makes it more challenging and more complicated. He, he he's, he's a smart guy. He comes with, it sort of comes with a philosophy as well. 
the two powerful men who were both believers, but uh, I think in the case of Carnegie, he's he's twisted it somehow into into wanting to uh, manipulate the people. My character essentially is he's a, he's a dictator. I uh, had imagined that before he started this crusade for this book that, you know, perhaps he was a kinder person. But this search has made him maniacal and, and very, very abusive as he feels that his power erodes. Some of those dictators start off very charismatic and human and, and moving and, um, um, and then they, they cross that line and they do become evil, you know. Um, so this character has a lot of humanity and that was the thing I think that Gary brought to it that maybe another actor wouldn't have been thinking about. You know, there's this great competition, you will, or, or battle of wills. And really it's about how the book for one person can mean good and the book for another could be used for evil. And it's the struggle over how this book will be used that is the centerpiece of the film. It's not right to keep that book hidden away. It's meant to be shared with others. It's meant to be spread. Is that what you want? With all my heart and soul. The Bible was interesting because we just wanted the book to, whatever our, our, our prop master designed to look, when you saw it, you go, oh, wow, that, that's a serious book, whatever it is. Because early on, you don't, you're not revealing it's a Bible, and we have this big cross on the cover, so how do we get away from showing that? And then you want to avoid the fact that it's in Braille, so when he has it open, you have to avoid shooting certain angles, and then you want him to have a lock on it so that nobody can access it, so that Carnegie has to struggle with it in the end. It's open. Yeah. And there's all these kind of... Uh, tricks you have to do to not let the audience know what it is in the first kind of 30 minutes. And then the audience does know what it is and it's okay to show the cover. But it's not okay to show what's inside. But I remember when I first read the script and when Carnegie makes a, a, a speech about how powerful the book is, um, uh, I, that, I don't, the hair did stand up on the back of my neck because I, because I, I went, wow, he, it synthesized Every sacred text there is, or book there is, how one person could look at it completely different than the other person. Hitchcock used to always say the MacGuffin is the thing in the briefcase. It could be a bomb, it could be diamonds, it can be a million dollars. The audience doesn't care, but you keep cutting to that briefcase, you know, and, and the urgency's there. Ultimately, it could be any of those, you know, and in our movie, it could be the Torah or the Quran. In the end, it's important, you know, to the story um, and what the information is, but it's not, a, this is not a religious movie. You know, I think this could have very easily been any kind of book of knowledge. It's about how powerful uh, sacred text and words are. That struck me, like right, right in the core. It's, and this is about how powerful faith can be and how much one has to sacrifice to, to keep one's faith. But I do believe that good movies have implicit messages that don't hit people over the head, but are entwined in the story that people get almost through osmosis. And I think some of our best movies that we've done have a message to them, not overtly, but implicitly. And I think this movie is that is the case. I think that, you know, uh, there's a line in the movie that sits very strongly with me, which is, is that Eli makes the comment that in the world before this apocalypse, we took for granted things that we had, and we didn't know how precious they were. It's the great theme of the movie, which is, is that through belief and faith and perseverance, we're capable of doing anything. In these uncertain times, we are forced to wrestle with fundamental questions about the future of mankind. If the worst were to happen, what would we do? How would we strive to maintain our humanity and persevere over seemingly impossible odds? 
Who would guide us? How would we rebuild our communities? Who would lead us into the future? If we had to build the world all over again, how would we start over? Book of Eli for me is about one man's journey to help revive civilization. And really it's about how the book for one person can mean good and the book for another could be used for evil. And it's the struggle over how this book will be used that is the centerpiece of the film. Do you really read the same book every day? Without fail. Eli's mission or belief or faith is based on protecting something no matter what stands in his way. Um, and yeah, along the way, he wants water and wants food and wants shelter, but he'll do without those to get um, this book where it needs to be. And that's the strongest faith in the movie. You know, There's nobody else fighting for something so simple. There's a reason why culturally we continue to be obsessed with ideas about the destruction of the world and ideas about a heroic figure ushering humanity through the destruction and starting a new world on the other side. In a post-apocalyptic era, what typically we see first is what they would refer to as the walking dead. People are numbed, they're dazed. They, they are connected, but not connected. They're able to see, but they're not able to see. And their bodies are on virtual shutdown. They've gone into that place of overwhelm. They've gone into that place of freeze. And so they walk around really not having all of their senses available to them. And many times there's a lot of emotion that comes with it, usually like a lot of sadness or a lot of anger. In a post-apocalyptic world, initially, there would be complete disorder and it would take a while for the dust to settle after you've completely just melted down a society. I think you're just imagining if, if you didn't have this and you didn't have that and you had no recourse to um, any kind of justice. You know, what is that like? You know, where to, to go out and try to get water or food you're, or to collect wood, you're in jeopardy. You're in incredible jeopardy. If you know how to get out in the world and touch things and and uh, do things as far as, you know, access things without computers, without cell phones, without automated everything. Live like a person that was here 50, even 100 years ago, I think you'll be all right. I think the currency in a post-apocalyptic world will be uh, just things that are, that are on you. You know, clothes, food if you have it, water if you have it, uh, shoes. Exchange may be, uh the modality of economic uh, relations, uh, like in the old days. I give you a cow, you gave me a horse. Hopefully in this world, you'll get a, you'll get a, good, a very real sense of um, how low people have had to go in order to stay alive. I think that was something uh, that very much reflected the way that we see Eli. He, he hunts things that we would never consider eating, but this is what he has to do to live. He's got an incredible amount of, of survival skill, because in this world, there's no way to survive for 30 years unless you've developed that kind of skill set. Eli being a man of faith, the sacrifice he has to make is protecting something as precious as, as the book he has. When people get in his way or obstruct him, he's got to harm some people. I don't want any trouble. That's too bad. and his desire to do what he's been charged to do, and he's been doing it for so long, he gets to a place where his anger, his violence is taken over. If I hit you, you have to make a decision. Are you going to hit me back, or are you going to say, okay, and walk away? Are you listening to me? I am now. Am I going to let you walk away, or am I going to proceed to kill you? Put that hand on me again, you won't get it back. All right, we're on to do it the hard way. In other words, once the violent dynamic starts, it escalates. Get him! What did he say? I think he meant kill him. In the event of a, of a fully blown disaster, the survivors would ask legitimately the question, is there a God? People who are extremely stressed out will often say that their belief in God will help them to get through 
hard times. Spirituality plays a huge role in healing in terms of trauma. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I love the, the notion of exploring questions of faith. You know, what are the things that we have faith in and, and what does that mean? And how does it affect our humanity and how we treat one another? Perseverance, faith, hope, these are they're orienting principles that, that lead us forward. They don't, they don't just simply tell us about how to interpret reality, but they, they, they point us in a direction. There is uh, this idea that people after the war and after this apocalypse happened in the decades after have kind of turned against faith. And it's one of the reasons why uh, Carnegie's quest to find a, a Bible is so difficult because they've all been destroyed. Uh, and uh, many people who blame uh, religion and, and, and uh, holy wars for the reason why we got into this mess, there's been almost kind of a reverse inquisition where a lot of people of religious faith and uh, religious works and things like the Bible have been kind of rounded up and destroyed. The absence of faith has kind of created a void in people's lives and Carnegie sees that as a way in which he can reach out to, the, to people and control them. The Bible is the book of answers that, uh, that needs to be uh, mined for what it says, not only about the past and the present, but also the future. That was probably the strongest theme running through the, the movie was how precious uh, sacred text and words are, and particularly this, this book, and in the wrong hands, how it can be twisted and manipulated to, to make uh, people do things that uh, they shouldn't be doing. No more questions about the book, all right? One guy wants it for very kind of evil, means and one guy wants it just for protection because he, he knows it may be used in the future for good god is good is he not all the time the two powerful men who are both believers but uh i think in the case of carnegie he's he's twisted it somehow into into wanting to uh, manipulate the people you know it's funny as old as we are people like you and me we're the future. Individuals find themselves concerned about maintaining their own well-being. Some people will see their ability to maintain their own well-being by controlling those things that they care about. You're not going to be able to make him do what you want him to do. They would find a way to exercise that power. If they could do it by persuading people, that would be one thing. If it required coercion, they'd do that too. It's happened before. And it'll happen again. The person who would come to power would be one with the gift of gab, first of all, you know, and power of manipulation, whether it's good or bad. But like nowadays with our politicians, they all had something in common, which is they're able to get up in front of a large group of people and sway them in one way or the other. But along the way, uh, you know, power does corrupt. And in a pretty desperate world, I think even a good politician is gonna eventually have a lot of bad traits to kind of keep this society in order after, you know, an event like this. But humanity would do what it always does. I think people would band together, but, you know, human nature would take over. <laughs> People had more than they needed. We had no idea what was precious, what wasn't. <laughs> we threw away things people kill each other for now. We have not been on the brink of a collapse, not yet, because Democratic societies have a way of lifting themselves, and I think and I hope we are in that process. In the face of great adversity and great disaster, people get something out of coming together, and they get something out of doing something for someone else. It's altruism, really, and that is a very, very healing kind of experience for people. And I think that's a part of what he had to learn, to share, to do more for others than than for himself. And uh, he also runs across a young girl who's played by Mila who helps to remind him of being a human being that has to deal with other human beings. And in that conversation, she, she, she starts understanding how to have faith and, and how to start believing that there is a purpose in life and that, that you do have a goal. The goal of human life is to eventually get good enough at choosing the good inclination. 
which is not to say that the other will cease to exist, but that human life involves deliberate moral decision making. You hungry? There's a lot of food there. More than I can eat. Tell you what, we can share it. The people that choose to move forward in a situation like that and embrace others are really the leaders in terms of the next piece of starting over. What's interesting is that you keep on trying and that you endeavor to stay alive. And, um, and that's the miracle. And that's sometimes involuntary faith. The journey of Eli is a fascinating one. He's someone who seems to have incredible faith in what he's doing. That faith and belief is very symbolic, I think, for a lot of people in terms of finding faith and belief in their own lives. This film uh, paints both a bleak and a hopeful kind of future. It's like, yeah, it's very bleak, the surroundings and what you see and what people do to survive. But in the end, you know, what we want to leave in people's minds is hope because this guy was doing something for good and he's passing on some knowledge. If there was some kind of apocalypse, I think there's hope for humanity to get back to what, what really matters, you know. What Eli represents is hope and faith that humanity can rebuild. My name is Alan Hughes. I'm one half of the Hughes brothers. As some people like to say, it makes us feel like shit, but that's what they say sometimes when they meet one of us. Uh, we're feature film directors. Uh, we started our career with uh, Menace of Society, and then from there did Dead Presidents, a film called Dead Presidents. Uh, I believe after that we did a documentary called American Pimp. Uh, then we did a movie called From Hell with Johnny Depp. And now The Book of Eli with Denzel Washington and Gary Oldman. We started in music videos, um, uh, and we've done a lot of ads and TV and stuff like that, so there you have it. My name is Atticus Ross. I'm the composer on The Book of Eli. It's my third collaboration with the Hughes Brothers, um, and in fact, my only uh, film work has been with the Hughes Brothers. Better known um, for my work with, uh, within the record industry, my own band, 12 Rounds, um, which developed into more of a production career. Um, I've done a lot of work with Trent Reznor, Nine Inch Nails. I've also worked with James Addiction, Korn, Perry Farrell, The Twilight Thing, and a number of others. I love all the music in the movie, um, but in particular, there's a, um, a track that's really, it's really funky and moving, and it's it's called The Journey. It's uh, uh, Eli getting ready to start a new chapter in the movie and he's getting ready to move into a Carnegie's town. Um, Gary Oldman, played by Gary Oldman. And I just think that this track is just incredible because it, it is composition, but it it's all of what he does best um, because it's, it's uncanny and it, and, and it, and it, it is funky, um, but it's moving and it's a uh, atmospheric and all that stuff, but it's not like panoramic or anything else in the movie. So that, I thought that was, a, you know, that's one of my favorite tracks. And the other one is very emotional, getting back to the Abbey Road sessions and going from Atticus's house, where you should see it, there's just all this, uh, looks like a spaceship. <laughs> so it's doing all, all the, uh, you know, the meat potatoes of the composition was done in his home studio. And there's this track um, after the characters Laura saved uh, from a, an attack, and um, she's walking with Eli on the road afterwards. And I believe the track's called "Safe." Yeah. And um, it's beautiful. It starts off, you know, uh, if I can be literal, at, at home <laughs> with Atticus, and then the more emotional it gets, you don't even notice that the handoff happens, and it all of a sudden becomes these rich, um, the orchestra, you know. Um, um, it's the same movement, and it's she's she's breaking down after the attack emotionally, and then all of a sudden it just moves into the Abbey Road sessions we had, and 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 the the real orchestra, and um, 
uh, a lot of people have walked up to me who've seen it and just said they that really got them choked up. I would, you know, do all this music and then I give it to the stage how I how I've seen it. But then the next process is Alan goes through all the stems. It's not like you just put it I put it on the stage and I come in, oh, it's just playing as how I saw it. You know, he then does his thing with it. Oh, I'm gonna you know, mix this stem up, I'm going to drop the drums here, I'm going to change this, I'm going to do that. So in terms of like the score to the movie is an ever-changing situation between the two of us, right up, right up to the, you know, that last day. You know, I went in and I said, oh, you changed that. <laughs> and some composers are very precious about that. They, they give you their uh, music and their, that's what it is, they don't want you touching it. And, uh, that's what I like about collaborating with him as well, because you can write a piece and once you throw it up there on the screen on the mix, the final mix, as he was saying, it may be a bass line, it may be a horn, the horns, it may be some strings that are, something's not setting right, you don't know. Onto itself, it's beautiful. But once you put it up against a picture, you have to start massaging it and whatever. And he, He's the best in that respect because he's not precious about that part. You know, he's precious about his music, but not about. Ultimately, he understands that once we get it up there, we it all has to harmoniously work together, picture and sound. 